Oh, hello, everyone. Um, about 10 years ago, I was uh, sitting where you're sitting now. And um, I remember the after two weeks of intense uh, training, uh, good food, I'm standing behind you in the best party of the, the two weeks. So it's uh, the chateau is waiting. I hope this will be a, um, a, an interesting session. I heard that you had many questions and uh, concerns and things you want to discuss on MISO. So let's go. Um, let's see if I can. Uh, so I, I'll go through uh, a few things here. The value of the MR vaccination. Why do we do this? And how good is the vaccine? Uh, uh, the measles and rubella elimination. Uh, is it feasible? Can we do it, actually? Uh, then the historic uh, perspective of uh, uh, all, you know, historically for decades, uh, what are the elimination efforts that has been done to, to date? A global update and the current challenges. And in the end, a little bit of we can do more, the strategies that we have today to advance measles even more. So let me start with the value of vaccine. And uh, what other way, a better way to really remind ourselves uh, why we care about measles and rubella, right? The more than uh, 100, uh, it's 180, uh, 28,000 estimated deaths of measles in 2021. And then the congenital Cinderella, uh, rubella syndrome, CRS, about 100,000 still around the world. And I want you to look at the mother. Look at the eye of the mother, Right. She knows. She knows exactly what Mises is. She has her child in her arms. The rash of Mises is fading. And she knows exactly the risks of the complications that might occur after uh, the Mises uh, infection, uh, most acute phase. So um, I was in Guinea. There was somebody from Guinea here. Yes. In a refugee camp. And we had Mises cases. And so the day after we organized the big measles campaign, and it was fantastic to see that you had to just whisper on one end of the refugee camp, tomorrow is the measles vaccination. And boom, we had 2,000 people outside the tent the next day. So people absolutely knew the importance of this disease. So where are we? Uh, somehow this vaccine is a victim of its own success, right? Uh, a measles vaccination has prevented 56 million deaths worldwide from 2000 to 2021. These are estimates that CDC and WHO puts out every year. And you can see the difference between the, the uh, curve on the top without vaccination and the estimated deaths that have gone down over these 20 years. Uh, and then why is then measles and rubella a priority for immunization? And for programs and for should be for politicians as well. You see on the left hand side, the total immunization program in billion, the, the cost in, in billions of dollars for 94 countries, LMIC countries, uh, between 2011 and projected out to 2030. On the right hand side, you see the gain, the cost of illness approach and the gain where you can see that measles vaccination is not the largest component of immunization program cost, but accounts for up to 70% economic benefit and more than 80% of the deaths averted among the VPDs and with the greatest return on investment. And not just that, you also have a, uh, is this the last version? Hmm. I don't think this is the last version of my my uh, presentation, but never mind. We'll we'll go ahead and see what happens. So, <laughs> I I just wanted to say that measles vaccination have also a, a effect beyond the measles effect itself, right? It is uh, 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 if you introduce measles, you get an all cause mortality decrease in children, which is mainly due to this. Uh, uh, immunomodulating or immunosuppressant effect of vaccine, vaccines. And you see uh, of, of the disease itself, the immune, this immune amnesia, the immune amnesia is uh, really predisposing people for other opportunistic infections for weeks, for months, and even up to two to three years after uh, an infection. 
So we have very good vaccines, safe, effective. There is a high value to this vaccine. So uh, is it even possible that we can use this fantastic vaccine to do elimination? Can we do it? Is it feasible biologically, epidemiologically, technically, socially, politically, and economically? So first, let's look at some disease and vaccine prerequisites for an elimination program. And look at the one disease here, smallpox, that was eliminated, right? And on the far right-hand side, the COVID vaccine that we are probably going to live with for a very long time. And the difference between measles and rubella then, where you have uh, humans as the only host for both measles and rubella and smallpox, a clinically not so clin a, a, a distinct illness for measles and rubella. They can even be matched between themselves. But the main difference here is the contagiousness. So the r not, where you have measles that is extraordinarily transmissible, right? And then also looking at the effect of the vaccines where, mes where smallpox and rubella have very, very high effect on the first dose. Measles, you really do need to get your second dose to get the non-responders also in. So let's look at the different dimensions, the dimensions of elimination. First, the biological. Uh, humans are the only host. That's one prerequisite. Lifelong immunity after natural infection. Only one serotype and genetically stable viruses and chronic carriers do not exist. So these are all kind of the good news. However, as I was saying before, the high infectiousness, the transmissibility that is so high, and also that transmission can happen even you know, when uh, prior to the rash onset, so you don't know when kind of to isolate and, and be sure, and it can be spreading before you have evident uh, 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 disease. On the epidemiologic side, the uh, vi the you have virtually universal infection, right? So if you have rampant vaccination uh, in infection and no uh, vac vaccination, the virus is so spreading that everyone everyone gets it. And measles, as we say, is really finding that spot anywhere where where you have susceptibles. The reservoir is in humans, non-human, uh, uh, no non-human reservoirs, as I said. The transmission is dependent on the balance between the immune and the susceptible, right? And so everywhere where you have kind of a conglomerate of susceptibles, measles will definitely find this. However, if you have spread out the uh, susceptibles, the transmission will sooner or later die out. And, uh, uh, and even before all of the susceptibles are exhausted. So look at the uh, technically. Um, the uh, Technically, we have the safe and effective vaccines, right? Uh, we have the vaccines providing long-term protection against all known genotypes, accurate diagnostic tests, uh, also very important. Uh, however, um, on the technical side, we always have the struggle, right? With the cold chain, you need two doses. And it's not that much effective in the early infancy due to the maternal antibody that is also circulating postpartum. So uh, if on, the, on the bottom right, you have the economically, politically, and socially, the investment and the appetite for donors or for politically, the governments as well, to actually go ahead with an elimination or eradication program is not where it should be at this point in time. And I'll explain a little bit later when you have uh, the, uh, the more of a historic view of this. Uh, economic impact of the pandemic, the competing priorities that countries are actually acting on right now, and the vaccine trust issues. But we know that it has been done, right? In the Americas, it was done. So we have a proven concept of a full region that actually did this. And how did they do this? Well, you see in the 1980, about in 1980s, most countries had introduced the vaccine, but you were at something like 44, 43, 44%. And in the 1990s, you were up at 77% in coverage uh, of one dose. But then 
uh, you still had so many of the outbreaks going on. So what the PAHO, the Americas region, did was organizing campaigns after campaigns, one first of a big, big catch-up vaccination campaign, nine months to 14 years, a massive uh, campaign in every country with the, uh, with the game of really stopping endemic transmission. After that, they also did the follow-up campaigns with the second dose of measles and rubella in the one to five-year-olds. And then finally, uh, also did a catch, a speed up a campaign for rubella in the age group of 19 to 39 to really stop rubella and uh, CRS. So what happened? The last case of endemic in this time period of measles case was in 2002. And the last endemic case for rubella was in 2009. Next. So it was a success, right? but not so so long time. It was a verified, you had a verified uh, rubella uh, elimination in 2015, and then a, a verified elimination for measles in 2016. Uh, however, then things went not so good. You had seen in the last 10 years, a decrease of 10% in measles coverage. And the Measles transmission was re-established in Venezuela and in Brazil in 2018. Uh, so the uh, region actually lost its, its uh, regional verification. Um, and this was really of many, many reasons, right? You had uh, governments, maybe now they are engaged in the COVID vaccination, but translating that into routine immunization is not evident. National financing, very difficult to put that into limited resources in programs. Uh, health, primary health care systems not being properly financed, not enough health care workers to do the vaccination. And then on top of that, also some of vaccine hesitancy. So in summary, measles and uh, uh, elimination and eradication and for rubella, it is feasible, but challenges are very many both logistical, here you see in Pakistan in the latest flooding, political and financial, uh, but we should be able to do it sooner or later. It should be possible. So let's look at the historic perspective of the elimination efforts then. So what has been done globally? How have everyone tried to push this forward? So you see on the first side, the green, the PAHO experience, right? And then there was many discussion of, uh, of um, in the International Task Force for Disease Eradication, 2002 and 2009, establishing that really it was possible, it should be possible to do, uh, to eradicate measles. Uh, and then it came the last, in 2010, uh, SAGE was recommending and thinking about this as well, looking at all the evidence. And what they concluded was that SAGE, uh, that Measles could and should be eradicated, but it's not the time right now. The target date could not be set until we see later some of the bigger regions, Africa, Sierra, Emro, moving ahead. And also that um, it should be uh, in the context of strengthening health system. And it should also be as a help on the way to uh, eliminate and control, prevent um, CRS. Uh, right after the World Health Assembly established, you see on the bottom here, the, the sorry, here, the uh, uh, goals of both coverage of incidence and of, of mortality, uh, and some, some really high ambitious goal from the World Health Assembly. And right after the uh, uh, Global Vaccine Action Plan was also adopted by the World Health Assembly in 2012, with really ambitious regional goals, right? So you were saying that by 2020, there would be five regions that had already uh, eliminated measles on the way towards eradication worldwide. Uh, now, have we done that? No. PAHO went backwards. Uh, and now at the moment, we don't have any of the regions actually established and verified measles elimination. So in light of that, there was a new discussion, and that was done, it's SAGE, in 2015, 
uh, in Sage, and uh, it was very much a heated discussion, I can say, uh, between, you know, really saying that we need an eradication program to get the energy, the power, the money behind a new program to finally eliminate and eradicate measles. Um, and then on the other hand, we were hearing uh, from, for example, the African region, really hesitance, but because none of the countries had eliminated uh, measles. And it was such a way, way to be able to do. And we had other things, you know, on the way. It will mean a very big, big investment and big hesitancy also from the big donors. So uh, it was in the end decided that uh, we would say that uh, the uh, it is feasible and we should do it sometime. And when should we do it? It should be done when all the, uh, the, the, when we've made substantial progress in other regions, including Africa, to be able to move towards er elimination and eradication. At the time when there is a plan, when we can see it in sight, at looking at certain benchmarks of where we are, maybe at that point in time, establishing a, a plan, a costed plan, and then move ahead hard in the five-year period to be able to try and eliminate and finally eradicate jointly uh, measles. So I hope that in my lifetime uh, that this will actually move and that will come there. Um, so <clears throat> uh, let me see. This um, slide shows you where we are kind of at this moment with both on the, you have the definitions on the left-hand side, but the regional goals and where we are at the moment. We have uh, only still measles, um, rubella, as continued verified eliminated in the Pajo region and none of the other regions. You have uh, re-established still uh, two countries. It was in the Pajo. And if you look on the right-hand side, three out of the six country, uh, regions have re-established target states for elimination in their in, in their regions, right? Even Africa has done that. And they say 80% of the countries by 2030. So, um, and the other have already expired their goals since before, right? So if you look more granularly, you have measles on top, rubella uh, be below, and then where you still have the endemic countries are the green or the turquoise uh, countries, 77 countries that have now eliminated measles and 87 countries that have eliminated measles is still good progress. And you have a, a steady work from the ver regional verification committees working on uh, scrutinizing the data uh, for if the countries are uh, uh, could be verified as eliminated. Um, and then you also have a steady progress. What you say is usually you have a uh, help by the measles rubella to really push towards el elimination, which is easier with less transmissibility for the rubella. Uh, and uh, what we need to do is to look at the introduction, which still is pending in 19 countries that have not introduced rubella yet. And then also, because when you do that, you'll have a new push new uh, introduction and so on, you'll be able to pu push the agenda also for measles. And then 12 countries that have not introduced the second dose of measles-containing vaccines. So what are the challenges still? Well, many of them, right? You have um, many, uh, of, of above all the, the effect right now of the pandemic, the economic effect, you know, competing priorities by countries that are uh, struggling to be, uh, to uh, work uh, and, pr and promote and employ their healthcare workers, et cetera. You have gaps in immunity due to so many different things. And it varies, of course, by region. Weak, uh, fragile health systems, unrest, political turmoil that we saw uh, was one of the reasons behind PAHO's loss of their verified elimination status and vaccine acceptance and demand. Um, and then also you're looking at uh, that when you have a program that is okay working, but you still have slippage. So you, the susceptibles, they grow older and you need to have a much more complex 
program, right? Uh, when you reach elderly, we've seen that in the uh, in the uh, COVID world, how establishing programs is not too easy when it comes to elderly population in many parts. So let me just uh, show you a quick uh, global update on disease burden and challenges. Uh, so Kate was showing you this. We are worried that the dip in coverage of measles uh, and rubella is um, uh, from the last pandemic years. And the accumulated susceptibles that have been uh, accumulated over the pandemic years. And when you look at the reported data, which is a gross underestimation of the real numbers, you have the peak in 2019. Uh, and then in 2022, you see it uptick again after a certain silent period during the pandemic years. Uh, and then now we are really at that virgin time when we are holding our breaths and thinking what will happen. We know that the accumulation of susceptibles is there. We know what happens when the number of susceptibles are coming. And we know the complex world that Kate was describing previously with unrest, etc. This is dynamite really for um, new outbreaks that will might and probably will happen unless we act and act now as well. And the little sister rubella is following the same system, the same kind of pattern with a peak in 2019 and an uptick in cases right now. Um, so Kate showed this slide where you saw all of the ongoing large and disruptive campaigns the last 12 months. Um, we are particularly afraid when it comes to sub-Saharan Africa because there you have the immunity gaps that are the highest. The surveillance at the same time have been decreasing. So during the pandemic year with the loss of logistics, the burden on healthcare workers, the difficulty of accessing maybe toolkits, et cetera, the, we're probably working a little bit in blind. Uh, so the testing is decreasing and we see that the quality of sense sensitivity of surveillance reporting is also decreasing. So it is a time when we kind of, as I said, hold our breath. Immunity gaps are widening. The campaigns have been delayed or and routine immunization disrupted and real need for recovery of immunization programs. The urgent action and the political will that is needed is really now. So where are we in the final section on the current strategies and what can we do more? What can we do more? Um, so a lot. And this is very much described in both the IA2030, the Mises Rubella Strategic Framework, which responds very clearly to IA2030, and then as a tool of how to react to um, uh, outbreaks, we have the Outbreak Strategic Response Plan, which is being activated and used now for training and rollout and risk assessment in countries. Um, and some of the things that can be and can be done better and can be done more are these in uh, four strategies, so to say. To increase the routine immunization is, of course, the basis, fixed outreach, but also the puries. And then the establishment of the second year of life, uh, measles 2 and DTP4, et cetera, the boosters. What we need to do is expand this uh, vaccination across the life course, but it's particularly measuring what's happening at the, se the second year of life and establishing that in all countries. It's not what it should be today. On the other strategies here, you have so many other possibilities of looping back and being able to reach children that have been lost over, the, uh, over time. So the missed opportunity is one, every time a child enters a health facility anywhere, you should be asked, have you been vaccinated? And then get offered or transferred for vaccination. Policies for catch-up vaccination, school entry check, and something called tailoring immunization program, listening to why uh, children, parents do not bring their children for vaccination and then try to adopt the programs. Uh, the supplementary uh, activities that should be done, uh, and I'll come back to those a little bit later, and then specifically work on the outbreak response, making timely a, a response really a priority and a root cause analysis after measles outbreaks to really see what, what happened 
and, and what did what went wrong. We have a zillion different support for this, for programs in WHO, both from Catch Up and the missed opportunities I talked about, the second year of life, and also the demand and the health service quality guidance that is available right now that you can, uh, I'm sure you're aware of. And then there is a, a firm look at the campaigns that are very expensive and pull uh, healthcare workers maybe out of their services. Uh, and for example, the risk assessments, the, pol the look at the polio synergies kind of work with them when they do their supervisory visits to pull back the children that needs to be vaccinated. The tailoring SIAs in the highest risk groups and not the least the integrated um, uh, health campaigns. So these are 57 campaigns planned in the next um, two years and only by 10 to 25 percent of them have added integrated campaigns with vitamin A and others. Uh, and this, of course, would help maximize the health benefit and the, the, the gain of the population, right? Okay, so every, anyone in India here can raise their hand and, and get a star, yes. Uh, I got this slide from Sunil Bal, uh, and uh, this was uh, show what he showed in, in SAGE at the last time when we heavily discussed what's happening with measles. Um, and they are the stars of really looking at the sub subnational level, the coverage data, and what is the surveillance signaling, and where do we need to make our efforts? So here is a specific plan where they uh, they low, medium, and high risk different districts and have tailored uh, 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 strategies into the towards the roadmap of measles and rubella elimination in India by 2020. Three. It's not happened yet, but uh, still the, the strategy of really district-centered approach uh, seems to be working very, very much. Finally, we need to think about innovation, right? Uh, the microarray patches, if you look at the 100 microneedle patches on the front there, compared to what is in the back of everything that ne is needed in logistics for the same amount of traditional vaccination. So, uh, I, and then on the rapid test as well, how fast in 20, 30 minutes, if you can just get a diagnostic and how fast you then can work and respond in the outbreaks. So this is also, but this is more near in the future, one, two years, the regulatory approvals and things are moving. And we have good proof of concept of that these rapid tests works the way they do with COVID, right? It has really been now an everyday uh, work. We hope this will be the same thing with Mises as well. And to celebrate, uh, Mateus and, and Kirsten uh, throw, threw me this slide uh, yesterday as well of uh, uh, really celebrating, Kate was mentioning this, the game changer of a microarray patch and the announcement yesterday of immunogenicity that is equivalent or the same uh, demonstrated uh, in this clinical trial phase one, two, uh, on the microarray patches for children first time. So it's really a game changer. I am really excited about this. And uh, we'll now have to see if the world can produce manufacturer enough of these the regulatory approval pathways will go fast, but this uh, this is really something that uh, probably will change quite a lot. My next to last slide is this one, where I've experienced the last five years as EPI uh, head in Geneva, really frustration from countries themselves, seeing all the vertical programs kind of com coming at the I strategy, measles, MNT, influenza, meningia, one after the other, asking for attention, time, uh, separate campaigns, etc. The time for this is not now. Uh, it really is that these would have to work together. And we've tried this in the IA 2030 quite firmly as well. Put all those programs together. Talk how you manage surveillance. Talk how you manage campaigns. Please look at how all of your programs can help routine immunization. It's only with the synergies there and the capacities we have in polio program and others that really we can see a strengthened program uh, that will also in the end eliminate uh, uh, measles. So in IA2030, we have uh, measles as the tracer, measles as the signal, uh, the coal, canary in the coal mine, as, as Kate was saying, 
really for saying we need to find where the measles cases are that, and start from there, uh, our strategies for firming up and, and supporting, uh, strengthening our system, and that way uh, get rid of this deadly disease. The campaign we're having a lot of hope about, uh, uh, the catch-up vaccination, but I wanted to finalize with one slide, and it's more on the kind of opportunities, because we hear so much bad. I think there is a lot of ten attention, right? You have, in COVID, suddenly we had attention of the world of vaccination. And uh, so it really sparked an interest for that a lot. We also see super a lot of attention on pandemic preparedness, investment in surveillance, uh, and then also investment in, in health systems, right? Um, and a system approach that seems to be floating, supporting measles, but also all the other diseases. Emphasis in uh, this economic benefit that we have from measles. Also, uh, the big catch-up that we are hoping now in the next one, two years will move us ahead towards elimination really strongly. If we can get this going with reprogramming plans and implementation of all the strategies that we looked ahead. Thank you. Very much done uh, for you. The clock didn't go, so I'm sure probably it was passed. So questions, so I'll start Tanya. Hi, um, thanks for the presentation. Um, can you comment on uh, congenital um, rubella syndrome and sort of the barrier that that poses for introduction of the vaccine? Well, <clears throat> it does. In our position paper um, in WHO, what we say is we you would want to have an 80% coverage in uh, your programs of uh, measles or if you have just measles before uh, you introduce the rubella. Uh, because what, what you see is, of course, if you, if you push the susceptibility window into older age group when you introduce it in children and you don't have the natural immunity uh, gathered so that you still have pockets of uh, women being susceptible when they come into childbearing uh, ages, that is a, a risk, right? So the, the way to come forward with this is when you do your introduction of rubella uh, to do a catch-up of many age group at the same time. Ideally, in our position paper, we say between nine months and even up to 14 years to be sure that those cohorts then follow and in the meantime, you would have an increased immunity uh, uh, thresh uh, uh, the threshold for her herd immunity will go down, and you will have protection even later on. So, uh, please go ahead. So, I'm from India, and the 2023 we are planning to change the rates. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but uh, but I just want to know um, in places where there's control for measles and rubella, have you seen the rubella cases? Uh, you know nearing elimination, rubella nearing elimination than measles. The reason why I'm asking is uh, we had a last case of rubella virus positive on 18th February 2020 in West Bengal. Mm -hmm. And following that, um, we've not had like, uh, we just, we have IgM rubella positivity, mm -hmm. but not much of a strain. So can we be hoping that we are reaching elimination for rubella? Like, I'm just asking. <laughs> I'm just trying to be optimistic. It's not so optimistic. Uh, it's, it's actually more or less uh, more logic, right? Mm. Because when you do, um, you have um, uh, both the transmissibility that is lower with rubella, the effect of the vaccine is stronger with rubella, right? So it's really, you have a like a pull factor with the MR vaccination that when you increase with your coverage, you have a, a, a much uh, like sh lower threshold for actually reaching the elimination with the rubella. So yes, I think you have a chance and the rubella uh, coming before then maybe the measles, which is more transmissible. Yeah, thank you. I saw some hands. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Nidasha from India. It was a wonderful uh, uh, presentation. Thank you so much. My question is, what should be the strategy for a country that is aiming towards MR elimination, where SIAs are focusing on zero to five, under five children, but there is a constant shift of age of measles cases above five years? Mm -hmm. Introduce an adult vaccination schedule. Uh, I think one of the pieces, first of all, you could think if you have the 
possibility of expanding the age range, which is being discussed very much. As you say, you push the susceptible cohort higher and higher, and you will have, in the end, uh, problems where you really see the cases coming into different uh, age groups, and you need to respond to the two. So, so one one piece is, of course, if you expand the age range, maybe up to 15 first, or maybe even more. But then what we are trying to promote in the big catch-up campaign is a new, really a new way of thinking about catch-up vaccination. So have a steady, ongoing catch-up vaccination program, not a hit-and-run uh, kind of effort in 2023, but building those systems with the second year platform, with the booster doses, maybe an adult vaccination program. So you st constantly at every place where you reach the healthcare facilities actually get a chance to get that measles vaccination. So build it into the immunization, the programs at primary healthcare, a kind of norm to check the status, even if you're an adult and even if you're adolescent. I think that is the way to go to really stop in this kind of ever running outbreak mode uh, if you have too low of, of, uh, of uh, coverage. No other question? <laughs> well, uh, thank you. I'm Wahid from Pakistan. In 2018, we conducted a measles campaign in the country and there was a significant decrease in the measles cases. Uh, again, in 2021, we conducted an other measles and rubella campaign. But right after campaign, after two, three months, uh, there was an increase in measles cases. So can you uh, please uh, let us know that what is the efficacy and immunogenicity when the measles vaccine is given alone or it is given with rubella vaccine? Thank you. Uh so, so you have a kind of you the first dose with uh, with Mesas uh, is usually around uh, ninety three to ninety five percent, right? You have also, but you have a certain percent which are non responders as well on the first one, and then when you get to the second dose, you more or less are sure that you'll get to ninety seven ninety nine percent of of uh, of protection. However, in Pakistan, it's a tricky one, this one. The sec second national campaign that you had, I can't remember right now how much, how was the coverage uh, in the second, uh, in the second round? I think it was not bad, right? It was uh, more than 90%, 93 or 92. Yeah. Like but in your, your very densely and large country, uh, it depends on also, also where, where in the country did you have those pockets of non, uh, where you didn't reach them, right? Uh, and I'm sure you did the evaluation afterwards, looking at, uh, hotspots of measles where that came back and how eff effective was the vaccination campaign at that point, point in time. Maybe even looking at the logistic chain and how the cold chain was working during the campaign as well, right? Susceptibles. Uh, who has a question? Okay. Yeah. And I saw a hand there. No. Yeah. Susceptibles are finished. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your talk. So, uh, first of all, I would like to say that the second dose of the measles vaccine has been officially introduced in Guinea. Oh, good. <laughs> thank you. I'll change this fight immediately. <laughs> um, now, my question is, um, even though we we have this, introduced this since December, but um, you know, because you know Guinea where you've been there, we don't have the rubella vaccine in the routine immunization. We only have the measles vaccine. But now we've been seeing uh, rubella cases. How... What's the approach to that? Well, well um, I guess you have to, in your night tag, really look at your your data, uh, right? Uh, how many cases? Where are they? Or do you have CRS cases as well that you've uh, diagnosed? Do you know? Not that you know, or, or if your sensitivity of the of, of the picking them up. 
Um, I think your NITAC should have a look at it seriously. And if you want some help from WHO to have a look at that as well, at your epidemiology, what are the coverage that you are, what are the risks, and what particularly is then the strategy for introduction. Uh, so you have uh, the possibility of getting the Gavi uh, support for the introduction of the rubella as well. But then think about the strategy. Is it only introduction or would you actually do a multi-age cohort campaign when you do the introduction at the same time? Oh, thank you. We keep hearing about denominator issues and I think we're all aware of the challenge. Um, I do a lot of work in Papua New Guinea, and we don't even have a national denominator, let alone anything subnational. And I think a lot of people are in a similar situation, yeah. hopefully not quite so dire. What simple cost-effective mechanisms, are there anything you would suggest to increase our awareness of denominators? Like even microplaning at the local level is poor. Where do we start to get a sense of denominators? New, very expensive national census. <laughs> it's been 22 years ago. <laughs> That's going to be tough in PNG, um, uh, right? Uh, well, uh, there are this very difficult, right, to do. Um, what you can do is a kind of estimations, as you were saying, bottom up with the micro uh, planning. Uh, using uh, maybe even some of GIS and estimations of uh, new equipment, so where you have populations, movements in central uh, populations. What we use today, and it's, it's sometimes frustrating even in the in the calculation of the WUNIC figures that we have, is this uh, kind of going back and forth with countries of saying we use the population, UN population data, but we know that we have much more in Mozambique is one of the latest uh, and Congo is another one where where there is a population movement where uh, we we really so it's it's a it's a huge a huge challenge um we have to be maybe just also evaluating when we uh, when we look at the data on the coverage uh, and we are planning our programs to just be lucid about the inconsistency and the difficulties of hiring correct even denominators. And then, then as I, and as I said, uh, use some of these new technologies just to estimate, uh, and, uh, and do the bottom up micro planning, uh, like district by district rather to like the India is doing. Esther. Thank you for that lecture. Uh, you showed that about uh, 50 something countries are planning to do the MR catch up campaign. And yes. uh, that is based on the, the outbreaks. Uh, first of all, who is funding these countries? And number two, have we engaged the local governments to actually sensitize them on this as a priority need? Because oftentimes uh, we may see the need, but they may not see the need. Yeah, so so these 56 are the planned campaigns already now kind of adopted and accepted. Mm -hmm by the governments as well in these countries for the next two years, right? So um, I, uh, you know, the <laughs> what WHO is, is doing in their country offices is the technical advice day to day that, and you as well and UNICEF can do in the, in the, to, towards the government of showing, uh, we have some instruments of risk assessment of the buildup of susceptibles that, you know, um, black on white can show very much of the risks. Uh, you could calculate, as we did here, the economic benefit of uh, not of avoiding the outbreaks that you do. We know how dev devastating an outbreak is and how paralyzing it is for for the health sector, right? Uh, so I, I know it's not easy. Uh, maybe it's easier if you bring together the discussion that I had at the same time, the integrated campaigns where you have a stronger health benefit and also you respond to the needs of the populations uh, of bringing not only the Mesa's vaccination, but you bring other health intervention at the same time. Last question, Sophia. Thank you for your presentation. Could uh, new strategies like electronic reminders uh, help reaching some of these goals? Oh, definitely. And um, definitely that's part of kind of that inbuilt kind of catch up that you, that you do. So that's part of kind of the fixed, uh, system where you really do a recall using mobile phones. Many have used now that with the extension of the mobile reach kind of, 
which has been proven as a very eff- cost effective and good uh, way of kind of linking in as well. So definitely, yes. Okay.